This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's a story that I think the entire country is paying attention to. There's something that feels a little bit different about this edition of Alberta rattling its saber aimed at Ottawa. This fight that Danielle Smith is picking with the federal government that feels a little bit different. It feels a little bit more serious. The so-called get out of my backyard bill, the Provincial Priorities Act, Bill 18, that will soon be made law. The premier of Alberta saying that Ottawa is veering out of its lane, that it's not respecting Alberta's jurisdiction when it comes to how funding should flow. And we're talking about all kinds of applications, funding to address the housing crisis, funding to address harm reduction programs, as an example, to address the opioid crisis. How about funding for researchers funding for post-secondaries the premier essentially is saying that she wants to ensure that the funding is going to support or promote or prop up or procure priorities that the provincial government shares the prime minister for his part saying that alberta needs to quote get out of the way over the weekend that it makes sense for the feds to do deals with municipalities with health entities with housing entities and the like now we can and will explore this issue from a ton of different angles but this episode of real talk is focused specifically on post-secondaries. And in just a moment, you're going to hear from three individuals, one of them a distinguished professor, one of them a PhD student, and one of them an alumni of the University of Alberta. They're going to tell us what they make of the plans, Alberta's plan to take Ottawa to court if it doesn't respect the rules that Danielle Smith is laying out for the way that federal funds should flow to municipalities, post-secondary institutions, and the like. That's coming up in just a second. But first, you know that this episode of Real Talk wouldn't happen without our friends at Danatech. And they've got a pretty clear message. If you're in charge of ensuring that your team is getting the best safety training in the industry, look no further than Danatech. They've been Alberta's safety training leader for more than 30 years. Their courses are designed by experts with real on-the-job experience. Believe it, not all of them are, but at Danatech, that is the case. So you know that the courses are actually going to make a difference on your job site. You're going to save time lost to injuries. You'll stay compliant to changing regulations and Maybe most importantly for your bottom line, you're going to save money on training with Danatech. Big companies across the country are using their WIMIS, TDG, electrical, lifting device courses, and others for a great reason. Uh, But they've got a catalog of more than 150 of them across the board, which means that no matter what industry you're in, you're going to get the training you need. Visit Danatech.com today to see their courses and find out about bulk discounts. Well, let's get to this. Lots to talk about. This is the top story in Alberta politics right now. And I know that they're paying attention across the country, provinces to see what happens in this edition of Alberta saying it wants to be treated like Quebec. Uh, Dr. W. Andy Knight is a professor of international relations in the political science department at the University of Alberta. He's past chair of that department. Uh, Today, he currently holds the position of inaugural provost fellow, black excellence and leadership at the U of A. His popular podcast, blacktalk.ca, is now in season three. Uh, Andrea DiCasaretti is a PhD student in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. And Andy Grabia is an award-winning communicator, a writer, and social media expert. He's a former educator. Uh, He's been in a variety of PR positions, speech writing, government relations for more than 20 years. Uh, He was the social media manager for the University of Alberta for five years. And uh, as far as I can tell, has been a proud alum of that university, although I'm not sure how he's feeling today. We're going to find out about that (laughs) in just a quick second. Andy, why don't I throw the hot potato right over to you? Where's your head at right now? Uh... Well, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little fired up. I gotta say, uh, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little fed up with this government. I'm a little annoyed with our administration. I will say that as an alumnus, uh, failing to see it's been a week now, and we haven't heard a word from Professor Bill Flanagan at the University of Alberta or any other university or college leaders. They've put out statements through their people that are very generic, but uh, and this is kind of par for the course from our university leaders. The university 
of Alberta has had $200 million cut from its budget in the last four years and uh, barely heard a peep from senior administration. So as an alumnus who cares very much about the school and believes that uh, our president and our board chair uh, have a moral and actually fiduciary <laughs> obligation to protect the institution, um, it's a little frustrating, a little annoying to see. And then, of course, we have the government on the other side of this, which uh, just continues to make things worse for Albertans. I think that's probably a better, the best way to put it. Uh, yeah, that's where I'll leave it and let other people talk because otherwise I'll just I'll just go for the whole whatever a lot of time you've given me, right? So well, well the good the good news is is that we make our own rules around here, Andy. So uh, <laughs> so so I I want everybody to be able to approach this in a cathartic context and be able to say what needs to be said. Oh, uh, do you it, have a couch? Do you have a couch then? Because yeah. I need to lay down. I need some talk. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to be in my expert hands. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just a civilian here, uh, Doctor Knight. For for people that are you know tuning into Real Talk, maybe it's been a couple of weeks. They got a lot going on in their life. They've heard some rumblings about this they've seen that the premier's telling ottawa to butt out uh, but they don't quite know what's at stake here uh, can you dumb this down for for folks that have just a working level of politics well we all we all know about fortress alberta um this is the being a concept uh, that goes back to the kenny government but also i think it's started being uh weaponized by this current government um this notion that somehow uh, you, the Alberta government, the Alberta province, ought to be like Quebec, you know, a separate and distinct society, I guess, and have its own character and, and its own governance and not uh, be intruded upon by the federal government. So there's, there's a kind of a, uh, a sense that the, the, pre, the, pre, the premier of the province is making a, an attempt here at what I call creeping authoritarianism. It, it reminds me very much of uh, DeSantis in, in Florida mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, the notion that somehow she has to have control over how federal money is being spent in the province. And uh, and if any sort of um, research project doesn't meet her standard, her ideological standard, uh, then uh, the money ought to be sent back to Ottawa, I guess. Uh, this, this is This is a... This is a real fallacy, in, in, in my opinion, because the first thing you have to think about is who decides what ideology is going to be accepted as being the paramount ideology of all of Albertans. She gives the impression that all Albertans think exactly the way she does, and I don't think that's the case. And I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the next election, because I think, I think we're, we're going to have some challenges, actually to the premier because of this kind of stance that she's taken. Um, and, and, it does, and it goes beyond education, of course. We know that it also has to do with infrastructural projects, et cetera, et cetera. But today we're focusing on education. And I think um, my concern is that as a, as a researcher, I want to make sure that my, the quality of my research is what, is what matters, right? And the normative reason for doing the research is what matters for me. So I, I was very clear yesterday uh, in the press that we did uh, to talk about um, Andrea's very good work that she's done in terms of empirical studies. Um, I, I massacred her last name, but I, <laughs> I think that she's a wonderful researcher. And she's pointed out very clearly uh, that there is no evidence really that um, uh, the federal government is funding necessarily liberal projects. I mean, this how do you decide what a liberal project is? And I, I pointed to some things that I got funded for, for example, I had major funding from SHRC, the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council, for a project on children affected by war. Now, is that a, a left-wing project? Is that a right-wing project? Um, you know, where does that stand on the ideological spectrum other than it's concerned about uh, justice and fairness, protection of children? I mean, how can you sort of label that as a leftist project? And the impression that uh, the Premier is trying to give is that somehow these kinds of projects are somehow vetted uh, by, the, by, I guess, Trudeau and the Liberal uh, Cabinet to make sure that they're, they're funding projects that they like um, and that she wants to get in there and, and perhaps have uh, people on, on the right of the political spectrum being funded as well. Now, as far as I know, um, Calgary, University of Calgary, I got lots of friends at the University of Calgary, they're pretty right wing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but we don't even think about that when it comes to 
um, assessing their projects. We, we, we want to assess their projects based on, uh, you know, academic quality, uh, the merits of, of the theoretical position or the conceptual position, the merits of the empirical status of, of, of their research. Um, so this has nothing to do really with ideology as much as it has to do with uh, the quality and standard of academia. And that's how universities rise and fall uh, in terms of the international hierarchy. Um, uh, when you have these rankings, uh, the University of Alberta is doing very well on rankings these days because it, it's producing high quality research and um, and has great journals that they're that they're editing and and so on. So we, we have to sort of put a lot of the, the talk, the rhetoric of the premier in perspective. Uh, appreciate that, uh, Dr. Knight. I want to jump into the YouTube live chat here for, for just a second. Denis says, if the university president makes a comment, then he could become a target. The university could become a target yeah. of this government, which is an interesting point. Seventh Pilot says, oh, well, what's, what's today's topic? Attack the UCP, the same subject as yesterday. What, what we're doing here, Seventh Pilot, is trying to understand the impact of government legislation and what it means for thousands, if not millions of people. That's the purpose of a talk show like this. Uh, we'll get to more of your comments in just a second. And Andrea, we want to get to you in this interesting research that you and your partner did. But before we do, <laughs> I want to tee up the comment that the premier made. Uh, we played it on yesterday's show. I don't want to assume that everybody heard it. Uh, our friends at The Breakdown tweeted it out. This was Premier Daniel Smith over the weekend talking to David Cochran, power in politics, and it nicely tees up the research that, that Andrea has done. Let's, let's take a listen. Here's Daniel Smith. I have been given enough indication that the federal government uses its power through researchers to only fund certain types of opinions, certain types of researchers, and I don't think that's fair either. I, don't, I think we need to be able to have a balance in our university if we're going to have a robust robust, free, and democratic discussion about all issues. But the National Research Councils are, are depoliticized, right? It's, it's a jury of academics or peer-reviewed, and they make the decisions through application on, on research grants going to university, and it's all posted publicly, mm -hmm. so you can see what's there, but you, you don't you don't have confidence in that system? I, I have heard enough from some of our academics about how difficult it can be to be able to access some of that funding. So we just want to do a review and we want to just see if there's some way that we can make sure that we maintain the environment at universities, which there should be, which is that all people from all political perspectives are able to engage in a robust debate and have a robust research agenda. I, I, I can I can feel some researchers at the University of Calgary, the University of Alberta and, and places in, in, in your province getting anxious with that because, you know, the universities have agreements straight with these granting agencies. It's meant to be independent to fund, you know, a, a research that is protected by academic independence. I mean, well, what look, kind of a role do you see there for you? I, you know, I, I guess if we, if we did truly have balance in universities, then we would see that we would have just as many conservative commentators and just, as we do liberal commentators. Out of our journalism schools, we'd see just as many conservative-minded journalists graduate as we mm. do progressive-minded uh, journalists graduate. We don't see that. And so that leaves me to be concerned that we're not fostering the kind of environment that allows for balance, because we need to have balance. If we're going to have ba a balanced discussion in the broader pub public sphere, it begins at the universities. And I get that, but that would be an issue with campus culture, which is funded by provincial governments. Mm -hmm. This is like medical research and scientific research and, 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 and humanities research that is not necessarily determining the makeup and composition of the people who you, work at it. You know, I guess university. we'll see. That's why we're doing right. the review. We want to see uh, what kind of things are being funded. And if there are any areas that are, are problematic, we'll have to keep that in mind as uh, funding agreements are renewed. <laughs> it's kind of wild to hear the premier of a province say if there are any areas that are problematic <laughs> We'll have to review it, like problematic according to what parameters and to whom. But but Andrea, let me hand this over to you. You and your research partner were, were very intrigued by where the money flows. And you released some data pretty interesting on Twitter that really caught fire. Can you take us into those numbers? Yeah, I was going to say lucky for the government. I did the review. <laughs> Ping Lambeth and I have done the review as to where the funding is going. Um, and it's really, really interesting. Um, so we took the data that's publicly available from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which actually, when you look at federal funds to research, is a very small portion of the pie. But should research funds be unfairly allocated to disciplines that the government feels are progressive, it would be through SHRC. Um, so what we did, and I will note that all of this data is publicly available. Um, so everyone in Alberta has access to what is being funding, funded. What we did is we pulled data in order to make it easier to look at, and we sorted it by province and by discipline. 
So we took all of the competitive programs where the where um, the different disciplines compete each with each other for federal funding. So that's a lot of Canada grad Canada graduate scholarships, um, doctoral fellowships, and insight grants. Um, and so what we did was we pulled data from the past ten years. Um, so between 2013 and 2023, we looked at 35,000 cases <laughs> of what research the federal government is funding through SHRC. Uh, and the results were really, really fascinating. Um, so instead of funding disciplines that would traditionally be seen as more progressive and would look at social inequality and social justice issues, what we saw is that disciplines that kind of look at more individualistic research and focus far less on social justice or social inequality are absolutely dominating through SHRC funding. Um, so on the federal level, um, the most funded discipline is psychology, which actually accounts for 14.3% of all funded titles. Um, this is followed by education and then fine arts. Um, and then the number of funded projects and disciplines that are often mischaracterized as liberal leaning, such as sociology, receive far less funding at about 5.2%. Um, what's really interesting is that when you break it down per dollar and not just projects awarded the funding, um, one of the highest funded disciplines through the social sciences and humanities research council um, is actually business management and administrative studies. Um, and in Alberta, business management and administrative studies specifically occupied one of the largest portions of funding. Um, and a lot of research done through that discipline is something that the UCP openly supports, right? So we're in the process of breaking down what each project means and how that relates to what would be considered social justice research or social inequality research, right? So in business management and administration, we're looking at financial markets, innovation at Canadian businesses, and ways to increase charitable donations, which would all be the sort of thing that the UCP supports research on. Um, so if the argument for Bill 18 and for including post-secondary education institutions in it is that all the funding is being unfairly allocated to certain progressive disciplines, we have the data to absolutely refute that. That is in no way the case. I appreciate you making that those numbers accessible for us. Obviously, facts matter as a part of this discussion. Andy, do you think no, that they don't? Okay, no, go ahead. No, they don't. Go ahead. I mean, this is this is clearly the case. This, this we're in the post truth era. These facts do not matter to this government. We know this to be the case. I mean, I mean, one of the the things that I would say about Andrea's research or what she's done, which is fantastic, but it it's accepting something that shouldn't be accepted in the first place, which is that the federal government does not interfere, does not pick winners and losers when it comes to research for these grants. There is the federal government gives a pot of money to the tri councils and a lot of other organizations, NSERC, CFI, whatever, and says, go do your business, make Canada better, make us smarter, make us richer, make us wealthier, make us healthier. End of story. It's preposterous for the for for a premier of in this in, in, in Canada to go out there and start lobbying this stuff around without any proof without any information, without any knowledge of how things actually work. And we're supposed to sit here and somehow then go, well, okay, but if we accept that premise, it's really not that bad. I'm not accepting that premise in the first place. It's preposterous. Also, I would like to point out that we're all <laughs> focusing here on Shirk. If you think that once this government is done with Shirk, they're not going to start looking at things that they deem anti-Albertan in the sciences and engineering, whether it be a better battery or solar panels or anything else, you are sadly mistaken because this government, this woman <laughs> uh, has the memory of a goldfish. She has the restraint of a toddler. She meddles in everything based on what the last person told her. And they're going to start looking at this. I mean, think about the heart attack that these people had in opposition when David Suzuki was given an honorary degree by the University of Alberta. The guy just walked across the stage and gave a speech to students. That was the whole total, top, like the total sum of what he did. And people lost their goddamn minds. And I think this is, I think it's naive to think that this premier is only going to stop or they're not really, you know, one of the other things that I'm going to see is, well, th this is what Quebec already does. They're probably not going to be as crazy as Quebec is about it. I beg to differ. This is a premier that got caught meddling in a, in a criminal prosecution case. 
uh, when she had no business doing so. This is a, a government that cut uh, has massively cut post-secondary funding, has targeted the University of Alberta specifically as it compares to other post-secondary institutions. This is a woman who runs a healthcare system where hospital patients are being put into hotels. I mean, I just, after a certain point, you got to like believe what they say and believe what they tell you, you know? And she just basically got on there and said, no, I'm going to meddle because I had a conversation with Jordan Peterson two days ago or whoever you know, it's the it's the it's the Donald Trump thing. Well, I talked to somebody. Well, who is somebody? Um, anyways, I'll stop now. But I just I want to say that those things I think that the central premise here is absolutely preposterous. It's not something we should accept. And I think that we will see further meddling unless we get some pushback on this. Dr. Knight. And I just, yeah, go ahead, oh, Andrea. Sorry. I just wanted to add to your point, Andy, the fact that all of this was said with no evidence behind it. I think what's very frustrating about it is that the data is so publicly available. <laughs> and if a couple of graduate students can pull the data and analyze it on a weekend, there's no reason the government shouldn't be able to. I mean, it's really wild to me that the advanced education minister went on national television and said that we have no idea what kind of research is being funded in Alberta. She, she should know. She should have a vested interest in knowing what kind of work we're all doing. And she literally tweeted the night before that she was at the University of Alberta with a bunch of other MLAs getting shown research that's happening at the University of Alberta. I mean, I just, UCP MLAs, federal MLAs, doesn't matter what government, they spend the number of government announcements that happen at, at, at the University of Alberta and other post-secondary institutions in this province. It's got to be at least once or twice a week that these people don't have an understanding is gross incompetence uh, and honestly just embarrassing for this province sorry sorry dr knight <laughs> don't don't apologize uh any of you for for bringing the heat and and uh keeping it real here but but dr knight you, you do look like you're ready to build on that i think andy gravia makes an interesting point there about the reputation of the university about the future uh of of innovation and, and research that may veer outside of what might be identified as so-called ucp values or ucp priorities the politicization of any post-secondary especially from a funding standpoint may be inevitable but that obviously doesn't make it positive Positive. Well, this is a very, very important point that Andy is raising, and also Andrea. I mean, universities are supposed to be not necessarily involved in trying to maintain balance. So this, this idea that somehow you have to have balance uh, is something that really struck me as as being strictly ideological, in, you know, on the part of the premier. And when she talks about that, you know, some some uh, some academics she's spoken to. I, the person that came to my mind was to, to say, uh, what academics, who are these people that she's talking to? Who has the air of the premier? Uh, because uh, she certainly didn't talk to me. She certainly didn't talk to many of my colleagues that I know uh, at the University of Alberta who were doing fantastic research. Um, Jared Wesley, for example, in my department in political science, doing wonderful research, but I don't think she, he got uh, a call from the premier or from the minister of advanced education. So there, there seems to be a problem, I think, think uh, with the methodology used by the, by the you know by the government in terms of how they draft uh, proposals like bills I mean uh, you don't draft a bill unless you've actually done the research first I think to draft the bill and then and then afterwards turn around and say well we, we don't know this this where this information is coming from therefore we need to sort of do the research and analysis to find out exactly how uh, individuals being funded and whether or not they have a liberal, liberal bias or conservative bias or whatever, uh, that seems to be putting the cart before the horse in some ways. Um, you should already have had your people do the research and then draft the bill. Uh, you know, so there must there obviously are going to be some major flaws with the bill that has not been based on any sort of, of, of research. And especially as Andrea puts it, um, a lot of this information is readily available. A lot of it is online. I mean, the breakdown, uh, somebody else did a, a study of the, the breakdown of the committees that actually assess uh, these short grants and, and insert grants and CIHR uh, grants. A lot of these uh, individuals are listed even, the names of these individuals who assess those grants are listed and you can see where they're from. Some of them are not even from Canada. Uh, some of them are from outside of Canada because the whole purpose behind the federal granting system is to make sure you get the best quality individuals to assess these, um, these grants in a, in a neutral and, um, and bipartisan fashion. 
So I, I made the point yesterday um, that uh, that uh, when Harper government was in, in power in, in, in Ottawa, you know, if if uh, Daniel Smith was premier during that period of time, whether or not she would do the same thing to Harper she's doing right now to, to Trudeau. I think there's, there's a, there, there seems to be a sort of an anti-Trudeau, anti-liberal bias in this kind of discussion uh, that we need to be really uh, separate ourselves from. Um, this is the time with the complexity of the problems that we face requires collaboration between different levels of government. You know, rather than division between the various levels of government, where's the collaboration? Where's the where's the consultation? You know, if you if you just consult with one or two people uh, who hold the same position that you do, you're not really consulting. Uh, consultation should be a process that involves everybody, different angles, get a, a good sense of what different people are feeling. But you're not getting that in this particular case. So I, I think there there is some some need for concern here. And my sense, I, I keep calling it uh, creeping authoritarianism because there's an element of authoritarianism here in everything that she's said, um, anything that the, the Minister of uh, Advanced Education has said. There's this kind of creeping authoritarianism that um, if you're not careful and if you're not awakened to the idea of what constitutes authoritarianism, we can be in, be in a slumber and actually find ourselves regretting the governance that we have today. Uh, in, in just a second, I want to get to what, what some conservative columnists and, and political commentators are saying in the province of Alberta. And Andrew, we'll come to you first uh, in a minute. I want to ask you, I mean, is, is it a worthwhile pursuit to ensure that there's a balance of so-called conservative and, and progressive or conservative and liberal views or research on a university campus? Like, th- does that even make sense? Is that possible We'll go there in just a second. Uh, You're listening or watching to a Real Talk roundtable on Bill 18, the Provincial Priorities Act, or as the Premier is calling it, the Get Out of My Backyard Act. The conversation is made possible by Real Talk partners like our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy who want to remind you that in a world where the need for sustainable solutions has never been more critical, solar energy emerges as a beacon of hope. The sun, a boundless resource that graces us with its presence each day, holds the key to a cleaner, greener future for generations to come. And at Kubi Renewable Energy, they believe in the transformative power of solar. By harnessing the inexhaustible energy of the sun, we not only reduce our independence or our dependence on finite fossil fuels, but also pave the way to an area, a more resilient planet, where the possibilities are endless, the benefits abundant, Get a free quote for solar on your business, your home, your cabin, your cottage, your farm by visiting kubienergy.ca today. If you're looking to get organized, if you're looking to declutter and you want to work with the best team in the business, get the most bang for your buck on custom closets and storage solutions, believe me when I tell you that nobody does it better than California Closets. And it all starts with a free design consultation where you can learn more about their approach. You've got absolutely nothing to lose Their design team can talk to you about garage storage systems. They can talk to you about Murphy beds that can turn that home office into a guest room or vice versa. Laundry room solutions, boot rooms, mud rooms, you name it, entertainment centers. California Closets does it better than anybody else. The consultation's free at californiaclosets.ca. Hey, have you had a chance to check out in the Metro Edmonton region that brand new Friesen Brothers, Glenora, 142nd Street, 107th Avenue? Johnny, we're still hearing reports of of, of small, well, maybe medium-sized lineups outside the Friesen Brothers, the new Friesen Brothers. Yeah, you got to be a VIP to get in right now. Yeah, you got to be a VIP. got to be a bit of a big (laughs) deal. They're treating everybody the same, and once you get in there, the line moves quickly, and you can check out what sets this store apart including a butcher shop with dry aged alberta beef it's aged in store under friesen brothers master butchers supervision plus 100 percent grass fed and grass finished alberta beef available they've got a fabulous plant-based section they've got the sourdough station if custom sandwiches are your thing and don't forget that four season patio with the wine bar it's all part of the new friesen brothers glenora And as we get into this time of year, we know that the reality is wildfire will affect the entire country. Uh, Of course, in B.C., Alberta, wildfire fighters, wildland firefighters are getting ready to go to work. And so is the team at Complete Care Restoration. 
Now, they hope that you never have to call them, but if wildfire does impact you or your community, or flood for that matter, black mold, asbestos, whatever it is, they're experts. They're certified professionals in restoring properties and rebuilding peace of mind. Their team's ready to respond 24-7 if disaster strikes. Make sure you contact Complete Care Restoration. We're talking to uh, Andy Grabia, an alum at the U of A, Dr. W. Andy Knight, a professor at the University of Alberta, and Andrew DeSicaretti, uh, who's a researcher there. Andrew, am I doing okay with your, with your last name, by the way? De Cassaretti. De Thank you for the correction. Oh, Thank you for great. the correction. I appreciate it. Oh. I can't come on here and say that facts matter and then butcher your last name the entire time. So uh, this Bill 18, uh, David Staples uh, of the Edmonton <laughs> Journal political columnist, right. Andy, come on. Uh, you know, he, he's been right. You lost me right away. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, I know. He, he, but he's, he's been writing about this. He's been writing about the column. He's been quoting uh, Sylvain Charlebois, the, the so-called food professor oh, yeah. who's been on the show before. And, and anyway, so he, he says you know, David Staples was, was trumpeting yesterday the fact that the, uh, Daniel Smith, the premier, mentioning his column in the legislature. That's a big deal for anybody. We always appreciate when the premier mentions Real Talk, get a few extra downloads. But Gary Lamphere, another well-known conservative columnist, political commentator, tweets out, the Dippers outrage, referencing the Alberta official opposition NDP, says shows you're over the target, David. He says the Lib Dips, uh, which is, of course, I guess the Trudeau Singh coalition, the federal government, have funded so-called, in quotes he has it, climate science research from the start, using it as cover for their anti-Alberta, anti-oil policies. That from Gary Lamphere. Andrea, this gets... Is- this gets sorry. I just want to say this gets exactly to what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's not going to be shirk. It's not just going to be shirk. Sorry, Andrea. Yeah, but no, but and we'll and we'll get into it. Yeah. But Andrea, to you first, is it a worthwhile pursuit? Does it make sense to endeavor to get campus perspectives, research, etc., balanced on so-called conservative and liberal? So I I actually do want to pull up the data and talk about who isn't receiving funding because that seems to be a big debate here, right? Is that there's a group of people that are not receiving federal funding for their research. And when you pull up the data, which is again, completely publicly available uh, through the SHRC database, uh, as well as Statistics Canada, um, the people receiving the least amount of funding are actually Indigenous scholars at 4% of the total funding, as well as visible minorities with only 17% of the total SHRC funding. Um, So if we want to talk about voices that are not being heard and not being funded, those would be them. Um, I agree with Dr. Knight's assessment in that it's very difficult to assign a political ideology to a certain sect of discipline. Um, We laugh in sociology because the most famous theory to ever come out of sociology is structural functionalism, (laughs) where the whole goal is to maintain social order in order to prop up capitalism. It is a complete misconception that sociology and disciplines that look at social structures are an agenda for the left. Um, And I'll use myself as an example. Right now, what I'm waiting on to hear if it is funded by SHRC is my project on rural maternity in Alberta. My goal is to work with the government and to take that research and say, our healthcare system is strained right now. Here's what people in rural Alberta need. Here's how we can streamline the resources. Would that be considered political? I'm not sure under this new bill. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I don't know. Uh, Dr. Knight, you're nodding your head. How would you respond to what Andrea just put out there? I mean, Andrea is absolutely right about this. Um, you know, I, I, I put myself right in the midst of this discussion because I've been one person, a person of color, who've been pretty fortunate to get funding from SHRP and from CIHR and uh, a, a number of bodies, including the Department of National Defense. I'm doing a project right now on looking at the... Um, the impact that white supremacy, for example, has on the Canadian military forces. And that's not a project necessarily, I think, that um, the, the Alberta government would want to support, but it's funded uh, outside of Alberta uh, by the federal government, uh, the Department of National Defense. Now, the, the, thing, the question is, what constitutes uh, you know, uh, uh, an ideological project that this UCP doesn't like? And I think this is what lies at the bottom (laughs) of this discussion that we need to unearth, because I think things like, you know, LGBTQ issues, uh, questions having to do with um, uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, people who have been marginalized for a very long time within our society, including Black people, 
Uh, those are kind of things that I don't think the Alberta um, government is very interested in right now. Uh, but necessarily, they have to be funded because they are they speak to the issue of of justice and fairness, the inclusiveness of individuals, and uh, within our society. And I think if you want to be a government of Albertans, you ought to be a government of all Albertans, not just some Albertans, not just the, the rich Albertans. Uh, there are poor Albertans that need to be also um, addressed in terms of their needs. Uh, there are people who may not necessarily be included in the history of this province that need to be included. So I, I think it's important for us to focus on that as well. And rather than spend time, you know, trying to sort of um, micromanage the, the short process or micromanage the process of the federal government granting uh, to institutions in, uh, in, in this province, we ought to be doing the, the real work of making Alberta a better place. I think Andy mentioned that before. How, how is this bill going to make Alberta better? Uh, I can't see it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else will see it, but I, I don't see how we're going to make Alberta a better place just by having a bill like this. That seems so draconian. Yeah, I mean, it might have nothing to do with making Alberta better, and it might have more to do with scoring political points. Like that, that, that right. to me seems to be kind of the obvious. Uh, motivating, motivating factor behind all of this. Uh, in, in our YouTube live chat, Dwayne says, you know, Peter Lougheed, uh I've, I've seen the Lougheed name dropped a lot in the live chat over the past couple of weeks. Says Lougheed would object uh, to Gary Lamphere and David Staples. The, the, you know, he supported responsible oil industry development. Peter Lougheed knew, for example, that water would be an issue, and he was right. Uh, which is an interesting point to the former premier of Alberta, widely, I think, recognized as probably the greatest premier in Alberta's history. And Gravia, I can tell you can't oh. wait to well, jump I have in. I, I'd love to jump in on the Lougheed point because this gets back to sort of what we're talking about here is there are a lot of conservatives out there right now who don't think who would describe Peter Lougheed as not being conservative. I mean, this gets to the heart of the matter here, which is define liberal versus conservative. What exactly does that mean? I mean, Ryan, you and I have had our private conversations before. I consider myself to sort of be a traditionalist and a conservative. The thought of a, a thinking about a university as a place where the pursuit of truth doesn't happen, where we're not where we're not dealing with objective reality, where we're not looking at facts and verifying information, all of which happens through these these granting councils in some sort of need for balance is absolutely preposterous to me. The truth is not balanced. The truth is the truth. And, uh, you know, you're going to you're going to hear people say, well, even, you know, there's, you know, in the in the liberal arts, this is questionable. I mean, yeah, I guess we can talk about that. But I mean, there's lots of things that are still verifiable within these areas of study. And I think it's absolutely preposterous. The reality to me is, is that what these people are describing as conservative are ideas that cannot survive scrutiny. They do no. not hold up. They are not intellectually vigorous. They are bad ideas. They've been proven to be bad ideas and rather than adjust these people are having temper tantrums and saying well then the, there's some nefarious plot out to get the rest of us because it can't be the fact that uh i'm wrong in thinking that x y and z i mean that's what it gets down to here um and i, I just want to if i can i just want to jump in here again on if i can talk a little bit so i know i said i'm an alumnus but i worked at the university for a long time and i worked in government relations and i've worked in marketing communications i'm familiar with how the grant process goes and so carla peck and Aunt dr knight referenced here talked a lot about sort of how the the grants are chosen at in ottawa on the ottawa side of things but i think it's important here to stress in fact how the grants are sort of given here to the researchers the research is tied, the, the grants are tied to the researchers, not the institution. Okay, the researchers apply for these grants. They get the money. The university's job in this is administrative. They sign off on the checks. They take the money in to make sure that professors, like professors can't use this to pay their own salary and things like that. Some of the money will go to like indirect costs of research. But the reality is, is that this money does not lie really with the university. It lies with the researcher. And what's going to happen here is if you have a government that starts meddling with this, these researchers are going to walk. And that money is going to go with them. Those researchers are going to say, you know what? I'm better off in BC. I'm better off in, in the United States. I'm better off in Ontario. I'm taking that money with me. We're going to have a brain drain on a massive amount 
Uh, and it's not just at the universities. These people are working in, you know, granting councils or sorry, at research agencies. They're working at places like Amy, like, you know, Canada has uh, Amy's it's artificial intelligence. It's one of Canada's three AI hubs in the country. Those people are joint appointments between the faculty of science and the faculty and, you know, this private company, Amy. Those people are going to walk. I think the other thing that I would like to point out here, too, is the research isn't always tied to one person. So, for example, Carla Peck, uh, pardon me, Carla, for using your research here. Carla Peck has a shirt grant that's worth $2.5 million to look at how his history is taught in Canadian classrooms. She is one of, I think, 47 researchers at 17 different institutions across the country looking at this. Now, what's going to happen if the government says, hey, we don't like you trying to to decide that the Japanese internment of, uh, or the Canadian, you know, Japanese internment, German internment during World War II is too woke for us. We're not going to let Carla get that money. Not only is Carla going to say, I'm out of here, but more importantly, those researchers are probably not going to work with Carla in the first place because they don't want their funding challenged. So I think it's erroneous again here to say that this consequence is only institution i think it's erroneous for us to say that it's not going to affect other provinces and i think it's erroneous to say that it's going to have no effect like oh it's just going to be like quebec does and nobody's going to make it like it's not going to have a difference people don't trust this government and i think again it gets back to you know just you know believe what they say sorry i'm rambling i'm so fired up no, I just want to add to that because I think you bring up a really good point about the individual. So a lot of the shirk funding actually goes to students and grad students. Yes. Um, and the shirk funding has not been increased in decades. So this idea that we're getting all this money to promote a leftist agenda, I mean, Andy and I were laughing earlier because I'm like, don't worry, they're not giving us any money anyways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the campus food bank can barely keep up with demand. The highest um, proportion of users are graduate students. And these are people that do not do it for the money. They are people that are in Alberta to make Alberta a better place. And it's a very weird fight to pick with us that are here in this province doing research with funding that isn't even provided by the province to make the province a better place. It's an odd fight to pick. Well, and the context of all of this is interesting as well. Just to interject, I mean, to point out that that funding for post-secondaries essentially across the board, although not equitably, uh, has been cut from post-secondary institutions under the Jason Kenney and Danielle Smith governments as well. So when you start talking about uh, putting in a stopgap in between a, a free flow of funds, and I'm dumbing it down, but saying coming from Ottawa to, to researchers or Ottawa to the universities, uh, you, you could say that the, the impetus of, 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 or you know, the magnitude of this situation, let me say, is even more significant considering the trend that we're seeing uh, with funding coming from the province to post-secondaries right now. I mean, you, know, you might dumb it down and call it a double whammy, uh, yeah. Dr. Knight. Yeah, well, you know, this is a, the important point. Uh, first of all, the, the the province, the province of Alberta, uh, is responsible for education. I mean, we all know this, right? There's a kind of a um, an understanding that there's a division of labor uh, between the federal government and the and the provincial government. So they're responsible for education. But when you're slashing education in the way that the provincial government has done in the last few years, um, we under, we underwent a major cut in our educational funding. Uh, from the province in in this province um, at, the, at the University of Alberta and Calgary and Lethbridge and other uh, other institutions as well experienced major cuts. Uh, you know we should not be quibbling about the fact that the federal government is helping at least helping in the area of research where the provincial government is not uh, uh, giving us money. So so I, I think this is a is a non-starter to start to sort of blame the federal government for intruding into the provincial affairs of the country. It's almost the same situation, the housing crisis. The housing crisis emerged here. The federal government has um, some responsibility for the people of the country as a whole, but the provincial government has responsibility for, for housing. Um, if the provincial government is not doing enough to solve the housing crisis, then it's up to the federal government to step in and try to, uh, to help in this area. So I think this is a, this has to do with a, a, a new conceptualization of governance, especially in this particular era, when the challenges are very complex. I don't want to blame conservative governments because uh, you know we have different types of governments at the provincial level. 
you don't want to blame the conservative government necessarily. Um, but if you're not able, if you don't have the capability, right, to govern, then you expect maybe to move to the next level of governance in order to be able to get that capability, right? Is is, is a principle called subsidiarity, which is not mm -hmm. quite written into anything that we do in Canada, but it should be because this is the new sort of principle that guides many European countries when, when there's a sort of a, a conflict between, uh, uh, say, provinces or or states and the, the major government, the central government, uh, there is a principle of subsidiarity that's based on a principle of, of having the ability, either the legal ability or the material ability to govern. When you can't have that ability at the, at the provincial level, the lower levels of governance, then you probably go a step higher up the ladder to another level of governance in order to be able to get the things done that you want done for your people. So. I think this is a new principle that maybe should be um, adopted by the Alberta government. Certainly in Quebec, I was in Quebec. I lived in Quebec for five years. I went. I, I taught at Bishop's University in Lennoxville, Quebec. I know how I had to deal with funding in that province, and 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 so to, to compare what's happening here with what's happening in Quebec is really a non-starter to begin with, because in Quebec the provincial government has something called FCAR. It's a special fund to help researchers, right? And they use the provincial, the, the federal government's funding as supplemental to what the provincial government was doing. So let's let's bring that principle <laughs> to Alberta too. Let the Alberta government start to fund research and then use SHRC and NSERC and CIHR and other funding as supplemental to what they're doing. Uh, it's safe to say that not everybody's agreeing in, in the YouTube live chat. Uh, Tracy says brain drain is already happening. Uh, she's, a, I think, a career counselor. She says two thirds of my clients are asking for help finding work in other provinces uh, or in Europe. Bunny Slippers says, you know, we're talking about people, researchers that are working at basically startup companies on campus. Talk about losing entrepreneurs. Uh, meantime, Kenzie says, all right, well, great. Well, if they can't find their own work, we should assist them in leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Big Oiler fan, uh, how about those Oilers, uh, says conservatism has not changed in Alberta or Canada for 100 years, I beg to differ, but says yeah. the, it says the big change. <laughs> well, Andy, maybe we'll give you that one because you, you've just identified <laughs> as a traditionalist and a conservative five minutes ago. But Big Oiler fan says the big change is that the middle of the road, Trudeau liberals have gone drastically left over the past eight years. I mean, let, let's sort of call this for what it is. A lot of people that will be cheering on Bill 18, and listen, we're going to talk to a ton of people about this. Obviously, we'll cover this story from a bunch of different angles, but people are going to say university campuses have, have gone woke anyway. Uh, they've lost their way. They've lost their priorities. Whatever happened to what probably should be the number one mission of a university? Teaching, learning. I mean, should universities even be research centers? Should we set up private research centers, research outside of universities? universities. Graby, why don't you take this first? Well, those are all fair questions. And I think that's going to be one of the things that we might see come out of this is how the federal government responds to this. Now, I just want to backpedal a little bit here because I do think there are some questions here. Now, Dr. Knight identified sort of the constitutional powers that are section 91, 92, and 93, and 93 covers education. But my understanding is that a lot of the reason that the feds have always seen themselves having a place in, in research granting, at least, is uh, Section 91, which is trade and commerce. And so from their perspective, if they're talking about commercialization of research uh, and that it benefits our economy, there is a play, there is a federal role here to be played in terms of helping aid and abet that. Now, how far the feds want to push that, if they want to take it to court or something, or if they're just going to sort of let this be political rather than legal, I don't know. I think one of the other points here is that uh, no one cares about jurisdiction. I mean, we're all policy wonks. We're all sitting here talking about it. I have a minor in political science, a major in philosophy. I've, you know, I've, you know, I'm interested in jurisdictional powers. Do you think that a person in Stetler who is cancer cares that the medical isotopes that were created that help the medical testing and imaging for their for their treatment was created in a federally funded building? If Mike Flanagan, who used to be at the University of Alberta, but is now at Thompson Rivers University, is using federal funding to have a better model, use AI to have a better modeling of how when a forest fire is coming, do you think a farmer in Edson gives a shit that that money came from the federal government when it helps them get their herd out a few days earlier? You know, if an economist, a sociologist, 
and an urban planner come up with a wonderful paper with gives really wonderful solutions for homelessness in Alberta. Do any of us care that that money came from the federal government? No, we don't care. This is policy wonk stuff at a policy level. It also ignores the fact that our money goes to the federal government too. You know, we're paying, to, and this is, again, get me on the municipalities, that's a whole other thing, but our money is going to these places and we're just being undermined and ignored and saying, no, 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 this is this is completely different. Um, but yeah, I do think getting back to the research thing, it does beg the question. I mean, again, if I got, you know, it depends how far the federal government wants to go. I mean, if they really wanted to be spiteful, they could just say, F you, we'll just give the money to the rest of the provinces. Hey, Albertans, you elected this lunatic, uh, enjoy what you get. You know, they're not going to do that, but I think they, I wouldn't, you know, be like, oh, that's a crazy thought. Um, but they could do things like they could carve out admin centers that would sort of handle this money now instead uh, and work directly with the researchers rather than the institutions and try to put up a firewall of their own to prevent the government from meddling. Or there is a question, I mean, we know compared to the to the United States that the majority of research happens at Canadian universities, you know, and there has been an argument that we've sort of lost, there's been mission creep and we've lost our original pre purpose of teaching and learning at universities and maybe there should be a little less research happening there. So it could be the case where the Fed say, okay, well, we're going to set something up like the National Research Council or other organizations and we're just going to poach your researchers and there'll be a lot of researchers out there who don't like their teaching load who might just say, hey, fantastic, I'm out of here. I mean, if that were to materialize, obviously, I'm that... being very alarmist here. I understand I that. Getting... And I sound like I don't have any hair, but it sounds like my hair is on fire. But I really just don't trust this government in any way, shape or form. And I think that these are things that we all need to consider as possibilities. Yeah, I was going to say you're describing a scenario that it, that would take a long time to recover from uh, for obvious reasons. Listen, we, we, we've kept all three of you for longer than we asked. We respect your time. So so in closing, I want to come to each of you. Andrea, you first. At, 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 basically, at the, at the ground level for people, you know, whether or not somebody's listening to this. I, I saw people referencing plumbers and pipe fitters in the chat. Uh, maybe somebody's listening to this that's a, that's a musician. Somebody lives way up in northern Alberta or somebody lives down in Lethbridge, somebody that has a post-secondary degree or has five of them or has zero and is perfectly fine with that. Uh, why does the average person need to care about this? What ultimately big picture, like for the person that may not have sympathy for the research that might lose their funding on whatever, because uh, that doesn't impact them and that's not their problem. Uh, ultimately, big picture, Andrea, what's at stake? The big picture here from my perspective is that the government is trying to push this bill through on the basis of the fact that research is being funded unequally and that we do not know what is being funded. What I have shown and my partner Ping Limip have shown is that that is not true. We have the data to directly refute that. So from my perspective and my research and my opinions on this, is that we're holding the government accountable when they're trying to make policy and that policy is not being formed in any data. Dr. Knight? Well, the big picture for me is that, you know, our politicians need to be very, very clear about what they're doing in terms of trying to govern the province. Um, you cannot play fast and loose with facts. You cannot play fast and loose with the truth. So don't try to cover things up and pretend as though uh, you, you know, you're trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. There are people who will see through that and will challenge you. And I think this is exactly what's happening in this particular debate because people decided, no, enough is enough. We're going to challenge the provincial government on these, these things because uh, it seems as though the premier is playing fast and loose with the truth. And that's, that's my own personal opinion, but I think a lot of my colleagues feel the same way too. Uh, Grabia, we've got a, a question here in, in the chat from Wise Kyle, and the reason why I want to put it in front of you is because you may be surprised a couple of people uh, that are tuning in right now when you identified as a conservative, uh, and we get comments <laughs> like this all the time. Guests of ours do as well. Kyle wonders, Andy, could it be your hatred of the UCP is influencing your opinions on Bill 18, uh, what would yes. you say to other conservatives? Yeah, okay, okay. so you're a yeah. conservative and you acknowledge you, you <laughs> well, hate I mean, this government? 
I hate is a strong word. Do I do I trust? Do I think do I think this government is competent? No. Do I think this government has anything positive to say? No. Do I think that this government is formed on resentment and anger by white angry men? Yeah, that's exactly what I think. And I don't think this government has any conservative policies. I mean, <laughs> I could we could go down the list. I mean, this is the government that talks about nationalizing program. I mean, we can go down the list about what exactly a conservative is or a conservative is not. The one thing that I would like to point out here as we wrap things up, as we've spent this whole time talking about tri-council funding, tri-council funding is only one aspect of what the government of Canada provides to post-secondary institutions across this province. And we've also talked a lot about universities. We haven't talked about colleges. We haven't talked about training programs. We haven't talked about apprenticeships. The federal government gives 60% of the student loans to students across this country. Provinces only account for about 40%. If, for example, now all of a sudden this government, because Bill 18, the legislation is so wide open, it gives them the right to look at basically anything that they decide is a federal entity. If they decide that now all of a sudden, oh, we want to really screw, we want to tighten the belts and we want to, you know, really, you know, make these institutions smarter or we don't believe that, we believe that students shouldn't be getting these loans or whatever, well then, you know, the student Canadian student loan program is also at risk here. I think there's other, like, you know, infrastructure that, you, you know, uh, in 2009, the government of Canada um, gave $2 billion to post-secondary institutions across the country just to basically deal with deferred maintenance and buildings crumbling. Are we going to turn that away now because somehow that's federal meddling? Campus St. Jean at the University of Alberta uh, receives most of its funding from the the government of Canada. That ter- that deal comes up in a year or so. Is the government of Alberta then going to say, well, we don't actually want a French language campus on our university, and that money disappears. So I do think that we have to, you know, again, people are going to say I'm being alarmist and I'm over the top, but this legislation gets them, gives them the opportunity to meddle in anything. It doesn't even have to be financial. There's nothing fine. Like it can be a, ver- it can be an agreement about anything. And they just say, no, we're not interested. We're going to, you know, and I think with this government, they, you know, they like to play politics and then accuse others of playing politics. And so I don't think at this point that any of this sort of stuff is beyond them. And I just think that um, as Albertans, we have an an obligation to really understand um, how important these institutions are to our economic and social well-being. And I think we have an obligation to really learn about what is really going on here and what these the federal money does in terms of uh, providing uh, whether it be apprentices, whether it be people at McEwen, whether it be people at the university, the, the, the opportunity to better their lives. And uh, this government is putting that at risk. Appreciate that. That's Andy Grabia. Uh, is many things, uh, including an alum at the University of Alberta and the university's former social media manager. We've heard uh, and 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 uh, have benefited from excellent research by Andrea De Cesaretti, who's a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Alberta and uh, professor uh, W. Andy Knight, our guest as well. I want to thank all three of you for your time, perspective, and candor on this. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having us. You bet. Thank you. You bet. Uh, Great feedback in the live chat as well. Johnny, I want to hop into there in just a second and and see what, you know, folks, uh, you know, are are, are how they're processing this and what they're thinking. I thought there was a great comment in there from Jay Dignam. I want to give Jay Dignam a shout out who says the big picture here, the biggest picture here is independence of research. And I think if you have to sum it up in like five words, uh, I guess that's six. Uh, <laughs> I think that Jay Dignam get a, get, did a good job with that. Now, that's one of the benefits of, of either tuning into Real Talk Live on the Mixler live streaming audio app presented by California Closets or by watching us live stream on YouTube as you do get a chance to participate in the live chat, shape the editorial direction of the show, even have your questions asked to our guests. And, and I want to touch on whose questions we read and why as well coming up in just a quick second. Uh, before we do that, I want to let you know if you are are the one in your family if you're the one in your household that's making the decision on what your dogs or cats are going to be eating you owe it to them you owe it to yourselves to check out granddog.ca grand dog essentials quality raw food has a really neat new product you can check it out under the shop now link it's smack raw dehydrated dog food if you're interested in the benefits of raw 
but the thought of handling raw meat is unappealing to you, you know you're out there. There's a lot of folks out there that just kind of can't stomach it for whatever reason. Or maybe you're going camping this summer and you can't cart around a cooler just for your dog's food. Grand Dog's latest product launch could be exactly what you're looking for. Check out Smack Raw Dehydrated Food on their website, granddog.ca. It's scoopable convenience with the raw benefits. Plus, it's made right here in Canada. It offers a seamless transition from frozen raw and it's a cost effective raw alternative that's smack raw dehydrated dog food at granddog.ca if you're thinking of a big landscaping project this summer or maybe it's something a little bit more modest maybe you just need a retaining wall figured out or you're forecasting drainage issues the next time you get that big spring thaw or the big summer rainstorm you're going to want to get in touch with eden landscaping at landscape edmonton .ca. They offer personalized solutions, tailored designs that reflect individual style, preferences, lifestyle, creating a harmonious outdoor experience. You can check out their portfolio and get the conversation started with Mike and their design team. It's a family-owned business, proudly. That's Eden Landscaping at LandscapeEdmonton.ca. And a lot of talk about the energy industry. <laughs> We're talking about research at post-secondaries and talking about oil and gas. It's no secret that the oil sands and this industry is, of course, contributing to Canada's emissions. And that's why Pathways Alliance is working with governments on a proposed carbon capture and storage network for Canada's oil sands. Global energy demands are changing, and that's why Canada's six largest oil sands companies are working together to offer the world responsibly produced oil. Pathways Alliance is planning to build a large-scale carbon capture and storage network that will be designed to reduce emissions from operations, protect existing jobs, and create new ones. Responsibly produced energy is what the world wants, and it's what Alberta can provide. Interesting comment from Kenzie, who gets two points on the scoreboard, I guess, Johnny, because we've read two of Kenzie's comments during the show today, says if the provincial government has responsibility for cities, then it is reasonable to expect oversight. It's an interesting point to make, except for the fact that the municipalities, and you've heard them here on this show, how about our Alberta municipalities Real Talk Roundtables? We've got another one coming up in short order where, when they're talking about a you know a, a, like a thirty billion dollar infrastructure deficit where they're calling on the province to to take meaningful action on Alberta's crumbling infrastructure. They talk about the implications on communities and and how they're just not getting uh, the collaboration. How they're not getting the funding that they need from the province. So you've got municipalities across the province and across Canada. Quite frankly, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities calling on Ottawa to do more deals directly with the cities, directly with communities that are struggling, as an example, uh, with that housing crunch. And so this, an interesting one, is Alberta essentially sticks its neck out or maybe you want to say sticks a stick into the spokes of the way that the process is working right now because it doesn't like the way that it's playing out. But I don't know that the provincial government right now deserves credit for overseeing the cities and ensuring that they're in healthy fiscal order. I mean, you you look at, I mean, even in our home city, they they, they sort of got that finalized Mm -hmm. number of what that property tax Mm -hmm. increase is going to look like. Uh, Off the top of my head, I think the the city council was looking at about a six and a half, just under 7% increase. It's going to be closer to 10 now, nine point something as as all the chips fall because... Mm -hmm. They're not getting the funding they need. They're not getting the dollars flowing. So says, you know, Edmonton's mayor, for example, uh, claiming that the province owes Edmonton $60 million or so. Um, and they have no choice uh, but to, to, you know, increase that mill rate and increase property taxes. So the cities take one on a chin on the mm-hmm. chin because they're not getting what they need out of that provincial budget. It's a strange thing to hear, too, from the right, because I always thought a pillar of conservatism was less oversight, yeah. less government oversight. So I, I, I don't know. Free speech. I, it just it seems wrong here. I can't blame like, you know, you've got a reduction in Alberta uh, for educational funding. And then when they go try and get it from the feds, now you're they're trying to squander that as well. This this all seems not good to me, Ryan. No bueno. Yeah. I wanted to address something here in the, in the, the chat as well. I saw that uh, that uh, we we had asked one of Kyle's questions. Why is Kyle? And um, and I know that uh, we have sort of our, our you know our prominent commentators in the chat, and and a lot of you enjoy going back and forth, and we appreciate you keeping it civil. And and I know that you keep Johnny on his toes as he sort of tries to oversee the whole thing. But we appreciate the robust debate 
Um, and, and I just noticed something. I thought I might touch on it, even though this kind of goes and, and pulls the curtain back a little bit here. But I saw some people going, oh, my gosh, you know, what's he? Why is Ryan reading a question from Kyle? Why is reading Ryan reading that question? I just want to be clear about kind of the mission or the mandate of this show. And, and that is that this show does not plant its flag politically in a partisan sense and, and bring you only guests from this perspective or only guests from that perspective. We want to keep you guessing. We want to keep you feeling challenged. We want to reiterate the fact that we believe that there's a home for virtually anybody in our audience that, that has an, an ongoing or perpetual curiosity about the way that, that politics plays out, the way that politics affects our lives, uh, that wants to do better in their communities, that wants to be a, a citizen that contributes and, and understands how and why things happen. I think that the perspective of this show, Johnny, is made more rich, is made more deep by ensuring that we have diversity of perspective uh, among our audience members. Sure. And, and I think that the show benefits as well. From, you know, sometimes on this show, you're going to have people that come on and, and, and you know, f- what's an example off the top of my head? That hydrogen roundtable we had a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, really interesting community uh, being built. Bremner, it's called. If you missed it, you can check out our hydrogen roundtable uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, east of uh, Edmonton in this community is expected ultimately uh, could house, they say one day, you know, between 80 and 100,000 people in all of the homes, all of the, the, the buildings, all of the infrastructure there. I mean, the entire community is going to be fueled by hydrogen. Uh, now, some of you wrote in to say the innovation is incredible and the potential here is really exciting. And a lot of this uh, innovation and, de- and development and the implementation of it is happening right here in Alberta. And isn't that interesting? And, and others of you were very critical of, of the subject matter, uh, of our discussion around it, talking about how, you know, you, you believe that, that hydrogen, you know, uses too much water uh, through the process. And we talked about blue and green hydrogen. You, you, you talked about greenwashing. You talked about how you don't believe that this is a sustainable of a direction uh as as the uh, you know the champions of hydrogen are suggesting and, and i'll tell you something at the end of the day by fostering that you know by facilitating that conversation the round table on the show mm-hmm. then from hearing uh from a, bu- a bunch of different people and, and people like credentialed people with legitimate uh and educated perspectives on this i hope Uh, And I can speak for myself to say that I definitely learned more about it. Mm -hmm. I think I understand a little bit more about it. uh, And and with that basis of knowledge that that we glean from having these conversations, and and, and you don't get there, if you don't hear the different perspectives, then we're not going to understand the issues as well as we should. So then what good are the opinions that we may have on something if we don't fully Mm -hmm. understand it? So that's kind of the way our minds work. We welcome criticism. We welcome positive feedback. We welcome guest suggestions. We want to make sure that our conversation you know that that we're presenting a legitimate reputable talk show uh that deserves the audience that it has which i think is canada's most engaged and people enjoyed that episode go check it out it's one of our most watched uh, this month it really was so i think people learned a lot because a lot of us didn't know how how this is going to be implemented and eventually uh, a part of our future and I, i thought it was a really it was a long conversation but it had to be we needed a whole show to kind of explain exactly what's going on right yeah uh, i see chris in here that says ryan has a delusional belief he has a centrist talk show i mean i, I just it's it's kind of funny I'd, I'd rather talk that stuff out with somebody one-on-one over a beer but i just i just don't understand how you can't see that uh, we had charles adler on yesterday talking about the wokeness that he's had too much of and the 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 the, the pronouns in the bio of his twitter account well the absence of pronouns in the, in, in the bio of his twitter account and the like and and we welcome conversations from all kinds of commentators and all kinds of perspectives um and and, uh, and if you feel like a perspective is not being represented on the show, uh, then we encourage you to write in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We try to get to as, as many emails as we can through the week. And of course, on Fridays, uh, if your email is composed with that extra little bit of fire, with that extra little bit of oomph, it could be featured uh, every Friday in The Flamethrower, which is a weekly tradition, if you're new to the show, uh, presented by the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. That's Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. Uh, the best, most fiery emails that we've received through the week to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Uh, we got an email here from Anne who wrote in. It said, did anybody hear what the premier said on this? She said, for years and years, I've taught a truth about how people think. People always reveal themselves through their thinking. Uh, the phrase I use is, you see in others what exists in you. 
Uh, so when our premier says, and Nan says, I'm paraphrasing, I want to be in control essentially of what funding is given to institutions and cities and the like, because I don't want funding to go to continue or spread liberal thinking. Uh, Anne says all of us gullible folks are to think that funding equals, you know, votes, for example, in cities or from the youth or from school boards or what have you, because we will only allow our agenda to be put forth. Uh, Anne says it's time for us to wake up, wake up and see just how much of a threat uh, this government could be. She says, take off these rose colored glasses, see what's actually going on behind all that pretty language that makes you think that this government is doing something for you. It is not that from Anne, who writes in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Uh, we will keep an eye out uh, for your emails uh, heading into uh, the rest of this week. Uh, coming up uh, on Wednesday's episode, that'll be the, uh, what is that? That'll be the 17th of April. We're going to take a look at the federal budget. Of course, it drops this afternoon. If you're listening to this live, it comes out April 16th. We'll get a better sense of what that means for you, for your household, for your business and the like. That's a budget day recap. That's coming up on the April 17th episode of Real Talk on the 18th. Looking forward to a conversation. Uh, Johnny, as we wrap for the day, I'm excited to let everybody know that we're going to be speaking to an economist uh, out of Ottawa coming up on Thursday's episode. Some really interesting numbers and data. We're going to take a look at emissions. We're going to take a look at consumer behavior. Uh, seems like a simple question. Can we get a simple answer? Is the carbon tax actually working? Is it actually working? Has it changed your behavior? If so, have your say. Shoot us an email or a note. We'd love to include your real life perspective. That's coming up right here on Real Talk. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford, technical producer 